There is a lack of concern from our citizenry about the subject of term limits. Few know what it is and fewer still care to do anything about it, yet they continue to suffer from those politicians they re-elect that abuse their privileges by staying longer than they're welcome. At FIT, we believe it is time to understand what term limits means and motivate you to do something about it. FIT is proud to produce our resident expert and FIT contributor, Pete Nichols, to talk about this very important subject. All right, Pete Nichols, SaveHuntington.com. Yes. Okay. What exactly is term limits? Let's get this thing started. Well, term limits uh, in a very simple uh, explanation is, is that it puts a cap on the amount of years that an elected official can serve. Uh, for example, the President of the United States can only serve eight consecutive years or two terms or a total of ten years. Mm. So that, that pretty much is a, is a really good example of, you know, that everybody knows. Two right. terms and you're out. Type, That's it. Now, and now you, there's a problem with, I understand, state legislatures only have two years who are Congress people, right? Right. Well, and four uh, in the Senate. Exactly. Well, uh, Congress people in the United States Congress, they can serve forever. I mean, you got people like Harry Reid and, and other people been there 20, 24 years. John McCain's been in there for 24 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the problem is, is that in order to enact term limits, uh, for Congress, you have to go to Congress to get it enacted, and which is why we don't have term limits for Congress today. Hmm. So, so they're not likely to remove themselves. No, they're not going to cut their own uh, nose to spite their face. Okay, so what do we do when things seem to slow down and legislation is not being passed? Well, it, it's really it's up to the people, um, the voters, to organize themselves, and they can't sit around and wait for the political parties to do it for them. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest problem in Huntington is the same problem that we have all through Suffolk County, is apathy. Mm. And people are concerned, but they don't have direction, they don't have a mechanism in order to stop some of the shenanigans that are going on right now. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your issue with uh, the county and stop in, uh, in Spoda. What, what exactly happened and where are you now with it? And give us a little bit of the story. Well, back in 1993, the voters of Suffolk County uh, approved a referendum, overwhelmingly, that limited uh, county officials, uh, the district attorney, the sheriff, and the clerk, and all the county legislators to three terms. That's it. Twelve years and you're out. Isn't that enough? <laughs> the, the, the problem is, is that now that uh, the district attorney wants to stay a little bit longer. He wants to overturn that referendum that was passed in 1993. So in order to do that, he sued the Suffolk County legislator. And he wanted to get the court's opinion on whether or not the referendum 20 years ago was legal. And his argument was that since the state constitution mentions the, the words district attorney, uh, sheriff, and clerk, they feel that county residents don't have the power to regulate them, even though they're county officials. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very ridiculous argument. It is. Where's the people in this? Well, I mean, the polls that I've seen in Newsday and, and in other uh, online uh, news uh, markets, uh, overwhelmingly 90% say they agree with term limits. But the problem is that the district attorney, the sheriff, and the clerk are asking the courts to decide this issue instead of the people. So you, you have a separation. Yeah. The, the, the government, the, government the courts... Is, is claiming the, the, the higher ground here. Right, exactly. The, the people and the government are not the same. You know, the, the government exists outside the people. It sits on top of the people. And this is a perfect case where the people have spoken and this little fr frivolity where, oh, it's mentioned in the Constitution is absolutely ridiculous. How does it stand? Well, right now, um, unfortunately, it, it went through the courts. Uh, Judge Grazillo, uh, the Suffolk County Supreme Court, decided that uh, the sheriff, the district attorney, and the clerk were correct in their uh, position that the county residents do not have any control over the terms and office of, of these three individuals. So, it's bizarre. My, yeah, it's my, bizarre. Oh, it's, it's it's ridiculous. And my position was as. I was called in by several people to be an intervenor in this case. 
because the feeling was is that the attorney that was representing the legislature, which was being sued by Spoda, that the attorney was going to take a fall. He wasn't going to really represent the legislator to the fullest extent and sort of throw the case or lay down. Intervener, is that like a mediator? What is that? It's basically a, a citizen or a person on the outside that is allowed to become involved in the case who's not originally involved in the to case. To speak for the people? Pretty much. And wow. so if I was allowed to be an intervener and this attorney decided to do a sloppy case for the legislator, I would still have the right to appeal to go to the appellate court. So we lost in the, uh, the, the Supreme Court. They denied me to be an intervener. They said that Spoda and company can run uh, for uh, another term. And they went to the appellate court in Brooklyn recently, and they decided uh, against me intervening, and they also upheld the decision of the Supreme Court. They didn't deny your, your ability to respond. They just didn't, they just didn't accept your right. premise? Right. They, they said that you can be a friend of the court. This is according to the Judge Grisillo, um, but you, you have no status. You cannot intervene. So the people lost this one. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's about self-preservation. These guys, uh, you know, uh, Tom Spoda, uh, Vincent DeMarco, and the, the, the clerk, Drew the Pascal, you know, they should be run out of town. They're breaking the law. These are people who are sworn to uphold the law, decided the law no longer applies to them. Quick, quick reference to the same thing, and that is uh, Michael uh, Bloomberg's advancement right. of his own additional term. Right. Uh, he, he decided <clears throat> that he was going to, just like them, he decided that Here's an opportunity for him to continue his legacy. And he criticized uh, Giuliani for wanting to stay on after 9-11. And here this guy turns around and throws term limits out the window. Uh, and, and Give me a break. <laughs> to make the story even stranger is both Republican and Democrat parties have cross-endorsed, I call them the gang of three, Spoda, DeMarco, and Pascal, so for candidates for uh, this com upcoming election. So when you go to the polls, you don't have a choice. Right. You have both Republican and Democrat are the same candidates. I've seen that before very often in family court judges on the, on the, that they don't, they cross endorse, they're in, they're in every category you can possibly imagine. Uh, they, that should not be allowed. No, it, well the, the point is is that we, the people, have to stop that. And they're, you know, we go to the courts thinking just, the courts are going to make the right decision. Off the cuff, I get what you're saying, but for me, it doesn't work that a government would allow that. It doesn't work that anybody would allow that. That's not what our government is about. Well, representation by the people, I thought. Again, it, the government <coughs> exists outside the people. We are not one and the same with the elected So officials. they can create the game that's being played. Oh, they absolutely. Can, they throw I mean, all the rules. It doesn't make any it's, difference. It's all about self-preservation. It's uh, they, they constantly try to transcend the limits that we put on them. The, the referendum in 1993, that was a limit on the government to say you can only serve 12 years and you're out. Again, they try to transcend those limits and try to break free of them because they don't want to be. Like budgetary constraints, budget caps, you don't have that in Suffolk County. Let me ask you a question. Uh, California is a referendum state. Are we talking about the same thing when you say the referendum? Right. New York is, is a bit different. There's it's not only, a referendum state. No, New York is not a referendum state, but Suffolk is, an, is what they call an INR county, initiative and referendum county. There's yeah. very few counties in New York State that are our INR counties. In fact, uh, Governor Pataki, before he left office, was pushing to make all of New York State an INR state. But of course, who are we appealing to? But to the politicians who sit outside us in government, they don't want the people to have that kind of power. I I'm glad you, st you stood your place as an intervener in this particular case, but because it didn't win it, means that we're, just, we're all left out. Well, it it's not over yet. I mean, you well, know, that's good. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's there, there's still a chance that when the appeal, the, the time frame for the county to appeal the decision expires in May, and there's still a chance that I can, I can appeal to be let into the case and take this as far as, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court. But for every little bit of power that we give up or that we lose, every bit of social power we lose, right. political power is gained by these people who exist outside of the of the population i mean it's just I, i'm surprised that suffolk county with over two million people this isn't all over the national news i'm surprised i didn't know about it until you alerted me to it actually it was in the news day i guess i don't read the news day often enough yeah there were, there were there was a couple of articles in there that were that were pretty fair that pretty much hit it on the head and it, it it's culminating in the fact that republicans and democrats and the judges and the lawyers 
they're all in this game together. And, mm. you know, the, the sleeping, apathetic public has nowhere to turn. I mean, if you can't tur turn to the courts, you know, where can you turn? So w one of the things that I'm trying to do right now is to try to build a write-in candidate movement. And that's why, you know, next couple of weeks on my website, safehuntington.com, I'm going to start listing all the people who want to run as a write-in candidate because you don't have the same restrictions. You don't have to get 5,000 signatures. You don't have to have these signatures challenged in court. You don't have to be out there in the middle of summer. You can stick to the issues. You can tell people just to write your initials on election day. That's, that's it. That's it? That's all you got to do. How, how would the possibly, possibility be to, to win as a write-in candidate with so much power and finances on it's going to take a lot of effort, but it's going to take people to feel the need for change. I mean, things have to get bad before they get better. How do you, how do you propose to promote the writing candidacy? Well, it's not a bad idea. It's, it's, I mean, I hope this helps, you know, our no, program. Well, yeah. I, I, I certainly hope so, but what's going to happen in, in, the, in the future is, is that people are going to start to be more f or hear the word writing candidate more and more often. And now the way the new ballots are set up, all you have to do, you already have a pen in your hand, when you're filling in that box, all you would have to do is write somebody's initials like PN or CD. Mm. And the Board of Elections will acknowledge that as a vote for you. Well, it sounds like a great idea, but I, I'm just imagining out in front uh, how much a, a writing candidate would have to go through to, to be a part of the process or win, for well, that matter. Yeah, in, in East Hampton, uh, I, I forget her name, uh, someone ran for town supervisor and almost won as a writing candidate. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, Lisa Murkowski up in Alaska, she was already a, a senator. She already had the name recognition, but she ran as a write-in mm. and won. I mean, there are people that win office as writing candidates throughout the country. It's just that there's not a concerted effort. I mean, when you think about it as a writing candidate, you no longer have to report to the party bosses. You no longer have to adopt those positions that the party boss tells you to adopt. And when you think about it, when you go to the, the ballot in November, you have a choice between A or B. And if both of them are lousy choices, you have no choice at all. What, what if CD wins? All right, put my name up there and I win. Now, am I going to be held to a different standard with the other people who were not, I'm not the party guy, I'm CD? Well, I, I think at that point, not only would you... Can it be power-based out? Can it be pushed out? Can it be left out of meetings or committees? Uh, can you, I'm just looking ahead here. Well, I, I think it, it's a, it's a catch-22. You, you, you won't have the type of insider uh, clout that right. normally is associated with a winner. Right. But on the other hand, if you were to win as a write-in candidate, you would have so much more power. Right from social power that we're talking about, from yeah. the people who actually took the time to write your name, that I really think that you would probably be able to get whatever you want hmm. and bring that back home to your constituents. Would, would people that sometimes don't know and suddenly in charge are sometimes a pain in the ass. You know, I mean, let's face it, they, they pr produce and provocate, they move forward th things that maybe might not work. Well, it's, it's I'm, I'm guessing that uh, the yeah, it's furthest. <laughs> I'm trying to give you an argument against it here, but no, you know. no. It's sometimes, you know, in the, in the movie Moneyball, uh, the Boston yeah. Red Sox owner <laughs> yeah. told uh, you know Billy Bean that sometimes the first guy through the wall gets a little bloodied. Yeah, now, I'm not the first guy through the wall, but I'm hoping to make a big enough impact that people start to really think of this as an alternative yeah. to write in. I mean. Bloomberg, for all his faults, really hit the nail on the head with the scandal in New York City uh, when they were trying to buy votes from the Republican and Democrat Party for the, mm. for the mayor's run. He said, listen, he said, a lot of these people who are in office right now, he, he would never hire in a public sector. Mm. And really, that's unfortunately, that's the case, that these people are in charge of $100, $200 million budgets, and they're all politicians. Sure. And you have a, a district attorney who was a politician, and this is a very important job. And, and if he feels that the law doesn't apply to him, then he should no longer be district attorney. Uh, it's upsetting to know that we can't do anything about it, that you didn't do much on that case. But let's, let's talk about a little bit of what uh, the arguments for term limits would be. Why, why would we want to limit, in general, I know we covered a lot of things now, but what, what hits you with some of the things we need to talk about that would cause us to need to have term limits? Well, uh, term limits will not guarantee that the office holder will be a, a, a good administrator, that he'll be a good guy, he won't take bribes. Term limits will not guarantee that. Mm. But what term limits will do is, is that if you do have someone who is a party hack, 
someone who knows how to manipulate the electorate. Which every, but people are very fed up with that thing you just talked about. Well, that's because they're only given a, well they're only given a choice between two bad candidates in just about every election because they're picked by the party bosses. Right. You're really not given a third choice. I mean, there, there's probably maybe somebody, let's say, for example, that owns an auto body shop that has the knowledge and expertise and, and, and has the ability to lead people that will never get the chance to run for office and would be an asset to the county or the town. Sure, sure. But as a write-in candidate, he can run and he can participate in the system. Right now, 99.9% .9 of us are locked out of the system. Unless you are in with the party bosses and pay your dues, you are not going to be partaking in this system. Hmm. Well, would they be more, would, would people, would Congress be more responsible toward the constituents because they'll soon be constituents themselves with term limits in place? This well, is it's congressional, but I mean. Yeah, I, I think you're gonna get a different kind of person running for office. Like I said, there's, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that you're gonna get people to run for the right reasons. Hmm. But what will end up happening is, is that eventually you will have a whole different class of people running for office because it will no longer be a career. And also the, it would eliminate a lot of gridlock. I mean, you know, the, the idea that, you know, you can't, if, if, if you've got the same guy in office who's not going to change his position and he's been there for 18 years. Well, he's, he's going to placate to the lowest common denominator, which is usually the greatest common denominator. And he's going to keep saying those things and doing those things that got him elected in the first place. Mm. I mean, look at in Huntington, you have less than 23% of the eligible voters bothering to even show up at election time. So, you know, when you think about 75% of the people stay home. That's crazy. So who, win who wins? The person who gets 13% of the vote. It doesn't look good for us to break that, that uh, trend. Again, well, you know, Apathy is the biggest problem, and if you identify that as the biggest problem, writing candidates is a way to eliminate or at least diminish apathy. It certainly is. I mean, my, my argument about wanting term limits is it just seems like the power base gets too strong and the, and the, and the corruption would, would be more advanced. The more time that you're in, in power and control, the more likely that the abuses will show up. Right, you, you know how to work the system. Right. And, and what, you, what you want is you want people who don't know how to work the system. You want people who get elected from office who understand, who actually live in the real world, who don't live in the world of Washington or in town hall, and who have all these perks. I mean, it, it, it's a contradiction in terms to have a good politician. And to make a career out of being in politics, <laughs> I don't think is what our founding fathers meant right. to see. Candidates would be more likely to run for purpose of serving people rather than for other reasons. Well, you know, in terms of, of wanting government reform and limiting government, you know, writing candidates and, and term limits are, are definitely a step in the right direction. Would, they, would you think it would be easier or harder for Congress to pass legislation with, you know, with a... Well, I'm hoping it would be harder because some of the legislation <laughs> that they've been passing in the last few years are uh, costing an arm and a leg. Yeah, I know. I mean, you, you don't want a, an active, a, a very active government. You want a very inactive government. You, you want <coughs> people and you want the private sector to take control over more of what's going on than the government. I, I was going to say, I, I, don't, I don't know why people don't understand that. The, the more control that you get independently of your own ability, right. the more likely you'll get more of what you want is, is what, doesn't, that, well, doesn't everybody want that? You know, well, to get more stuff that they want, again, whatever it might be. If you right. throw it out to an agency or a government, how would you be more likely to get what you want? Exactly. I mean, you just look at the property tax mess in Suffolk County and New York State. I mean, you look at LIPA, you look at all these centrally controlled organizations, they, they just don't work. You know, it, it doesn't seem to me that anybody in charge for any length of time would, would be able to sustain themselves without looking like they're controlling something, too. Well, I mean, the perception is there that, you know, oh, absolutely. God, well, he's in place for such a long time. Look at him. Not doing shit for the last 18 years. Exactly. You know, why would it be another four years of the same thing? No, you're right, because the, the goals of a career politician, as soon as he gets elected the first time, mm. it's the, the second thing he does is he wakes up that second day and he starts running for office again. Right, right. So everything he does is for the sole purpose of getting reelected. I don't want to use this as an example, but I guess I should. Uh, it seems to me that. The, our current president is spending more time in his second term campaigning. I don't know whether he's doing this on 
local levels, I think he's doing this for the local politicians that may be on the fence of not winning, then it, then it does seem to be presidential. Well, I think he, he really <clears throat> believes what he says. Um, I, I think that he does believe that government is the great equalizer. And, you know, you have to understand that from, from the other perspective where they feel that an act of government is a good thing, they're referring to crony capitalism. They're referring to corporatism. They're referring to... As, as a bad thing. Right. They're referring to government or big corporations getting their hooks into these big contracts and, and screwing people. That's what they want to stop or what they say they want to stop. Right. But in reality, unless you have competition on every level of service, you know, in every county, city, state, yeah. you're not going to see uh, equality on any kind of scale. I don't like saying this, but I know that in, within capitalism, there's always a, there's a little bit of obvious corruption within within every entity. No matter what entity you have, you have, there is some corruption in capitalism. However, okay, if you look at it the other way, the black market and socialism it has far more classism and far more corruption within it right. than than it seems that our current party understands. Well, capitalism, in a strict definition, is, is the private production of goods and services. And socialism is the public you know, uh, distribution and production of goods and services. And what ends up happening is, is that capitalism always gets a bad rap whenever things go wrong. I mean, you look right. at the last economic crisis right. we had. Right. There was definitely uh, crony capitalists running around. There was definitely big government people running around. And you saw very little competition uh, for goods and services. Uh, all the money tied up from the Fed. I mean, it was just it was just a grab bag. And look what happened. It was a big balloon that burst. And the end at the end of the day, the taxpayers had to bail out these multi-billion dollar corporations. Yeah, isn't it? This, uh, don't uh, to me, it looks like we're going to be in for a little bit more of the same. It, it's it's not going to change. People need to wake up, and they have to take initiative on their own part. And they got to stop electing people. Mm. that are in cahoots with the party bosses and the, and the corporations. I'd like to say that most of those people are incumbents who pose the biggest problem because of the power base we talked about, the, that control system. But once that's gone, I mean, when you're in office for two terms, you're, you're 80 years, eight years as the presidential election right. would be, that's a significant amount of time in anyone's life. You know, it, it's like a drug. These guys get in there and they love the adulation, they love people calling them up, calling them sir. They love going to meetings, having their photos. They don't want to give that up and go back to sure. what? Yeah. <laughs> just just another schmo on the LIE driving back and forth <laughs> to work like the rest of us? Did you hear about the uh, amendment to cause Congress people to be subject to the same rules and laws that we have in terms of insurances, uh, benefits packages, health Everything. They've been kicking that around yeah, for I know. God knows how long, and it's, it's, it's never going to happen, it's right? It's unresolved. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll water it down. It's so in your estimation, the only thing to get us out of that would be a write-in candidacy? I mean, to get us out of that mode? I think so. You look at other countries around the world, I mean, you know, they, they dip their fingers in ink and they put it down for their candidate. I mean, all, all, all I'm asking is that people vote for who they think is the best candidate, not by what they tell you uh, that these are the candidates. All you got to do is take your pen and write someone's initials. My, my suggestion has always been, maybe you may remember I said this before because I keep saying it, but if we don't advance civic education at the earlier years in our public school systems or even a parochial, whatever, right. school system, curriculum, especially in the uh, middle years, I think, should start that civic education be a part of the program, just like it would be a math and a science. Right now, they're afraid to, uh, people say, oh, no, I'm not going to learn about politics. It'll take me too long to get it. Well, they do that with languages sometimes. Oh, I'm not going to learn in this other language. It'll take me too long to get it. Yep. I cannot barely speak the English language, whatever the case may be. But the education, if it doesn't start in the middle to get this civic education going to cause your issue to be real, tangible, that might work. I mean, well, so it'll take a while, obviously. Yeah, it's going to take a long time, but it really, people have to be fed up. I mean, there, there's so much apathy. Isn't that a shame? It, it's, it's ridiculous. I'd like to start, I know we've got to wrap this up, I'd like to start with that civic education thing, but is there anything else you can think about other than a write-in candidate that might stimulate the uh, public to get back out to vote well, I and mean, to be conscious of these issues you're bringing up? I think the internet is obviously one, one very huge way to, you know, to push these issues, but really it, it's going to take a small group of people who are determined, who have heads like rocks, yeah. that are going to blast through that wall 
and they're going to take the slings and arrows and they're going to challenge the party bosses they're going to talk about the issues and they're going to tell everybody what's going on that's that's the best what they say mm -hmm. antiseptic is shining a light on it thanks a lot pete nichols i hope some of these people put a helmet on when they go through that wall <laughs> political contingencies perceptions and media driven narratives are rapidly carrying away the social order the common good and in fact the common sense of all americans what used to be is no longer what should be change seems endlessly tied up in knots americans are far becoming victims of the brain salad surgery we ask you to challenge our solutions our facts and our conclusions we will continue to tell it like it is and hope you may gain a new perspective thank you for watching fit tv and we'll see you again next week